famous people no one has ever heard of, especially outside of Alberta. Two creeks, two buildings named for him, a hiking trail, a ridge in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, a Canada Post stamp. He pioneered irrigation in southern Alberta. He was the fastest, the strongest, the best. If you have heard of him, you're probably thinking right now, oh yeah, I know this story. He was enslaved in the South, but then transcended race to become a successful rancher and beloved icon. Singular, a big, amiable black cowboy, all alone in his blackness in Southern Alberta. Most of what you think you know probably begins and ends with the mythology created by this book, written in 1960 by historian and former Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, Dr. Grant McEwen. John Ware's legacy is trapped inside that mythology. I'm here to start a new conversation. I grew up in Bonesse on the outskirts of Calgary in the 50s and 60s. My father was a mailman. My mom was a homemaker in those days. That's me, Cheryl, in the green dress with my sister Noelle and our neighbors, the Heiser kids. And that's my brother, Richard. We are descendants of the Black Migration of 1910. Around 1,500 African Americans fleeing hatred in the southern U.S. Fleeing the bombing and burning of our homes and businesses. Fleeing the suppression of voting rights and confiscation of property. Fleeing lynching. Both sets of our maternal great-grandparents joined that migration. They had heard good things about Canada and were expecting a better welcome. I think this was probably May 25th or 26th, you got those guns for your birthday. We were getting ready to go to church, and Mom wanted our picture taken 
I remember um, being upset about something, but yeah. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, she had said you could have them in the picture, but you couldn't take them to church. So you said to the rest of us, <laughs> don't smile <laughs> for mom for this picture. And we're all trying really hard. And this one, we're doing a pretty good job of not smiling. For six days, Calgary, Alberta is the Wild West capital of the universe. The The Calgary Stampede, then and now, is a 10-day frenzied celebration of cowboy culture. It draws visitors from across the world and was a highlight of every summer. We watched Rawhide, Gunsmoke, Bonanza, The Lone Ranger, and every Dale Evans and Roy Rogers movie that was ever made. Other kids went through a cowboy phase, Richard and I parked ourselves right there and made ourselves at home. At least for a while. A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver. Go! Yeah, Pa? Get coming, he's behind the wagon. I can't get a shot at him from here. All of the TV shows, the cowboys were were white. Uh, if there was someone black on the screen, it was um, the cook or the helper kind of thing, and there was very few of those even. In truth, black cowboys were ubiquitous. But we couldn't have known that. It was a history that wasn't available to us or anyone else. When it looked like there wasn't room for us in that ranch house, we moved on. Richard pursued a new identity as an athlete. I decided I was going to be a writer. When you were starting to get into the sports and whatnot, that would have been just around the time that you went to the Glen Bow Museum. Yeah, I remember going, and then um, I remember the absolute shock, almost elation of seeing this John Ware picture and a bit of a display. Um, and so the, the idea of here in our area was this fairly famous uh, black cowboy was astounding. That day, that discovery, was the genesis of this journey. We should have known about him. I want his story to count in a way that I think he would want it to count. I want to find out where he came from. But you've heard the old saying, history is written by the victors. Being enslaved was not a position of advantage, and the births of black babies to enslaved mothers were rarely recorded. Years of research have taught me that finding him in historical records will not be easy. But that doesn't stop me. In 2012, to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the Stampede, I started working on a presentation about his life. I began building a team. The presentation turned into a play. John Ware reimagined. My first collaborator, who composed music for the play that you'll also hear her perform in this film, was my daughter, Miranda Martini. With this team, I made steps toward creating a new universe. One that began for me when Richard rushed home with news about a display at the Glenbow Museum. In this universe... John Ware is more than a prop in a happy story my country likes to tell itself about itself. He arrived in this part of the world in late September 1882 on the first major cattle drive from Texas. Within a week, there was a blizzard. The cowboys abandoned their cattle and raced to the ranch house. John Ware didn't make it back. 
When the storm cleared a few days later, a search party fanned out to look for his body. Passing the frozen carcasses of hundreds of cattle along the way, they eventually found him warming his hands over a fire with his cattle safe. It was the first time John Ware showed them he was more than his past. He was bigger than the names they called him. He was a person who knew what to do and how to do it. He would spend the next 23 years showing them, again and again. I was cook on the chuck wagon Sam Howe was running. We camped the first night just below the old South Fork corrals. It rained all night and the next morning. Just then, the horse wrangler came to camp, and John Ware was with him. He heard Sam tell the wrangler to hold the horses on top of the hill till sundown, as there was better feed up there. John questioned Sam about it. He said, if you're going to hold the horses on the bench, why not camp at the lone spruce tree? There's a good spring there and lots of dry wood. So Sam says to me, OK, Cook, camp on the hill. It rained again that night, and then a cloud burst in the mountains. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we heard the creek roaring. So when I was making breakfast, some of the boys went down to the creek to check it out. They came back and said that there was 10 feet of water going over the old campground where we would have been. John sure saved our lives that time. There are stories about his life, I believe, like that one. There are also many ridiculous yarns designed to make him seem more beast than human. Like the one that claims he pulled three people in a horse buggy 20 miles when their horses were killed by lightning. But among the indisputable truths is her, Mildred Jane Lewis. from a successful, influential Toronto Black family, the Lewises, who were active in a thriving African-Canadian community in Ontario, with roots going back to the 1830s. So close to the stars, I think I could fly with you. They moved to Alberta in 1889. Her father, Daniel Lewis, was an accomplished carpenter. Her mother, Charlotte, took in laundry to help keep their family fed. Of peach trees in this cold ground So rich in love But I can feel orange blossom Very many of our readers will join us in wishing Mr. John Ware and Bride, who were married on Tuesday morning, all happiness and prosperity in their new sphere of life. The ceremony was performed by the Reverend Mr. Cross of the Baptist Church at the residence of the bride's parents, Calgary. The bride is of a happy disposition, well-cultured and accomplished, and probably no man in the district has a greater number of warm personal friends than the groom, Mr. John Ware. The Tribune extends heartiest congratulations. As a couple and as a team, they clicked. She could read and write and keep a ledger. He was charming and stubborn. Together, they navigated the quagmire of land titles bureaucracy. They had six children, five of whom lived to adulthood. Arthur, the twins William and Mildred Jr., Robert, and the eldest, Janet, who they called Nettie. Nettie became the family story keeper. One of the first files I started as a writer in my 20s was the John Ware file. Somewhere in the early 2000s, I had the great fortune to connect with a family in the ghost town of Kirkcaldy, Alberta. 
The Mallorys were among the dearest friends of Nettie and the other Ware daughter, Mildred Jr. Hello, Mary. When Nettie died, she left dozens of boxes of family archives with them in this house. Over the years when I've come here, I've found photos of my uncle and, and all these other records that helped me to tie all the pieces of my, my own history into the Ware family history yes. as well. Good. When my ancestral community arrived in that migration of 1910, naturally enough, they formed friendships and alliances with the black people who were already here, including the Lewises and Wares. Napoleon and Willa Sneed, Cecil Jones, Andrew and Edith Risby, Dick Bellamy, L.G. Armstead, Bodie Bowen. They were all present in Nettie's archives. These were not faceless phantoms, nameless immigrants. This was my family. These were my people. And the wares were not singular anomalies. They were us. Finding the Mallories was key. Do you remember when you gave me these curlers? Were they just inside a cosmetics case? Or you don't ever remember um, helping Nettie roll up her hair or anything like that? No, no, I was not a hairdresser. <laughs> I don't. This is taken, I think, in the... Um, Peter Dawson Lodge, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like it was a birthday party. That, yeah, mm -hmm. I just got my driver's license about that time, and it was fun to drive into Vulcan and pick up my dear Mildred. Bring them back, bring them back for dinner. Did they like driving with a young guy who oh. just got his license? <laughs> uh, I was, they were all was tickled to see me, and I was always tickled to see them too. They were, you know, it, was, it was an honor to bring them back here. I read once that Nettie said she she didn't really like driving and that if she had to bring a cake to a function at the Women's Auxiliary, she preferred to ride a horse. Oh, yeah. Yes. She rode her horse to the hall and she'd have dessert in her, probably a cake in her, uh, her left hand and ride the horse up to the, <laughs> to the community hall. <laughs> Cake in one hand. What an amazing image. I would love to see that. Guess that I'm losing most of my mind now, but I know where it's gone when I look in your eyes. Cause I'm getting stupid and you're getting wiser every day And I hate to say it, but I know you'll do all right When I go, and I will go, I will go in the same way I came Arms swinging round and legs kicking out and Looking for someone to fight cause this world's hard and it's made me hard and I know sometimes I made it hard for you when time comes to take the fight from you I hope you find a way to understand ain't no denying you're just like your daddy but I know there's a bit of me in there when I look in your eyes You stomp through the kitchen, you spit and you ride Not saddle side, but your dreams are big as those blue prairie skies If I'd have known we live on Well, I'd probably have paid a little bit more mind If I could do it all again The Mallorys became important members of my team helping me to provide context for other researchers who were also seeking a more real person and a less mythological creature in John Ware's legacy. I grew up in Alberta, but um, throughout all of my upbringing, I'd never heard of John Ware. 
We never went to the museum. Nobody brought his name up at all. We talked about pioneers and homesteading and various things like that. In school? In school, mm -hmm. yeah. Never heard of John Ware. So for me, encountering John Ware was a kind of revision of the, the historical education I'd received up that, to that point. And because while I was growing up, and I'm sure you experienced something like this too, Everyone talked about Canada as the place where there was no racism and the United States was the horrible place. And thank goodness you're living here because if you lived in the United States, you would encounter racism. And mm -hmm. now you don't know anything of what it is, mm -hmm. right? Well, shock, surprise. Of course, we encountered racism here as well. But for a young child, it was actually confusing to me because uh, I absorbed that narrative that Canada is racist free. And yeah. so it was very confusing when I would have these racist encounters. Yeah. What's going on, I, exactly? I totally yeah. know what you're talking right. about. Right, <laughs> yeah. So... Is it just me? Like, I guess exactly. that was the one racist incident that <laughs> exactly. ever happened in Canada. But, oh, then, you know, two months later, oh, I guess Something this is the that, second one. That's right, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. And sometimes, Cheryl, I would even rationalize to myself, well, I guess that wasn't racism, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe if they don't actually use the N-word, then it's not actually racism, I guess, right? So yeah, you go through all of that sort of thing because we're just as Canadian as them, right? And we believe the, the national narratives as well. So when my mom told me about uh, John Ware, me going to, um, to uh, revise that history, to update my own history, for me was part of that process of looking back on my whole Canadian life and saying, wait a minute, what I was given is not the whole truth. There's a great big hole here. There's a huge hole here, absolutely, yeah. and I need to fill it. Tell me about your article that you're working on. Oh yeah, so this article started with me first reading um, John Ware's Cow Country by uh, Grant McEwen and um, being excited to read a history on, Gra on uh, John Ware but also being frustrated at the same time with the depiction of John Ware. So essentially the essay goes to this text, goes to um, John Ware's Cow Country, and it explores the different ways in which Grant McEwen has an ambivalent idea towards blackness. Tries to be good, but is also not as good as certainly today we would think of in his depictions of blackness. Are you... Um, ambivalent then about John Ware's Cow Country as a text? Yes, the short answer, yes. It's the only thing we have that is a comprehensive biography of John Ware. And Grant McEwen went and talked to people who had been connected or who had known John Ware, and he got a kind of oral story. Mm. On the other hand, yes, I am ambivalent because once more he goes back to the same old tropes, the same old... I have to say it, derogatory representations mm -hmm. uh, of blackness, male blackness in this case, um, that are not helpful. It is uh, a very confusing book, it is. isn't it? It is in that regard. You know, we always go back into history and we say, well, it was of the time. Yeah. But you know what? There were always people against slavery. There were always Absolutely. abolitionists, you know. So people always knew better. I have noticed that when people talk about blackness uh, in, the, in the past, so... Uh, early 20th century, they're not hesitant to use the N-word, for example. And I've read many descriptions that even defend its use, claiming, you know, it's just a descriptive term. Right. Shorty was called Shorty, Red was called mm -hmm. Red, and this black man, we called him the N-word. Yeah. yeah. Grant McEwen only once uses the term. Every text after that, he absolutely refrains from using the mm -hmm. word. So you're right, he does have an awareness. He certainly yeah. does. And he goes well beyond many writers of, of his era who were quite happy just to use it as a nickname. Once I moved back to Canada after teaching in the United States, I kind of rediscovered my Canadianism. And so I wanted to find a way to not just be exploring African-American history, but to make it North American, to make draw the connections to Canada. And um, I was very pleasantly surprised to discover that there is history in Alberta on the prairies that we can directly link to um, the North American black uh, story. Also buried in that Canadian national narrative hole is Southern Alberta's black cowboy history. All John Ware's counterparts that nobody bothered with. Leisha Bell. Tom Rengold, P. 
Pete Smith, Tom Robinson, Green Walters, Jim Whitford, Billy Welsh, and of course, us. We were horse riding, cowboy boot wearing, country people too. Prairies of Alberta, they ain't never heard of the things that are keeping you down. And the short native grasses don't care that the ashes of your dreams match their dry shade of brown. The prairies of Alberta. They ain't never heard of the things that are keeping you down And the short native grasses don't care that the ashes of your dreams match the dry shade of brown The prairies of Alberta They ain't never heard of the things that are keeping you down And the short native grasses Don't care that the ashes Of your dreams match the dry shade of brown So much of what I could find in the meager public record about John Ware's life seemed off shallow, misguided, racist. When Canadians of African descent share our historical narratives, we're faced with a toxic choice. Do we call it the N-word, or do we force ourselves to speak aloud a word that conjures death? A lot of people make the assumption because John Ware was so successful that he didn't face racism. And for me, one of the things that's really important about this project, and I'm really tormented about how to deal with it, is that some people called him Nigger John and insisted that he enjoyed that. And, or at the very least didn't mind and that it was a badge of affection or it was just a way of identifying him from, you know, from a different John. And so when the various places around the province were named for him originally, they were called. There are people who drop that word the minute I mention John Ware's name. To those who would do that, I repudiate you. His children had to publicly state, no, if there were people calling him that, it was behind his back. Nobody called him that to his face. I can remember teachers using the word. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, it's one of the reasons I didn't take shop class. You know, the, the shop teacher. Um, used the word. I remember coming into classes and the teacher had the word written up on the, on the blackboard from the previous class. So some people can't hear this kind of thing and feel empathy. Some people see it as an opportunity to, they see it as, a, as an opportunity for uh, to elevate themselves or to feel powerful. I, I don't I don't I don't even know why I'm even trying to figure out what they feel or why they why people do the things they do. The more research I did, the more what I learned about him reminded me of our lives. What was wearing to me in thinking back was just that ongoing every new experience was was met with that force, with that challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, eventually, you think of our neighborhood, mm -hmm. like that birthday party, like mm -hmm. those people, 
you know, there were very few problems amongst that group. Yeah, and that, they were some, that, some of that took a while, but they became your friends. People became mm -hmm. used to you, so you could walk down, you know, our, our neighborhood streets without having somebody, you know, drive by on their ride by on their motorbike and spit at you and shout out racial slurs. Um, but then moving to the next, yeah. if you had to go to the next uh, yeah. community or hockey rink yeah. to, to skate or play, yeah. you went through it all over again. I had absolute dread about going outside of the area where I was familiar. I was comfortable going to any park or playground in Bonas. That's where we were established, people knew us, and you knew there were people that would give you trouble, but you knew who they were. You knew mm -hmm. which house they exactly. lived in. Yeah. That was a house that you weren't allowed to walk. Play in their yard. Play or... in the yard or touch the fence. So. Yeah, yeah. I found quite a sad little um, interview with Bob Ware saying how much trouble he had finding work. Um, you know, so being John Ware's son, in and of itself wasn't enough to shield somebody from racism. It's more bothersome when you, you hear about it in John Ware's day and then with his children and then you think of your own experiences and you just really hope that that's not what our kids are gonna experience. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you first learn about John Ware? I heard about John Ware from my father, Daniel G. Hill, who was a historian fascinated with black history in yeah, Canada. Yeah, I know his work. And how did you feel hearing that story? Or uh, what we you... loved it. My brother and sister and I all loved it. He's a strong, powerful, entrepreneurial black cowboy in the Canadian West that sort of shattered all the stereotypes about who cowboys were supposed to be. So we loved that story. Many of the things that he did in the course of his everyday life happened right around here. So his church was right down there. And right here where the Hyatt is was the IG Baker Company where he met his wife Mildred. Just down the road was where Mildred's parents lived and they got married in her house. So it must have been really disconcerting for him never to really know how he was going to be received when he walked into a bar. Would he be served? Would he not? Would yeah, he be exactly. Would he be? Own, in his own place. Like lots of the cowboys, John used to go into town now and then on a spree. One time he went in with Harry Sinet. They went into the Royal Hotel and stood down the bar waiting to be served. A man called Jackson was bartender. He served other people and did this and that, but didn't go near John and Harry. So John called to him to come, and he answered that he didn't serve niggers. John got mad. I can see just how mad he'd get. He jumped over the counter, picked Jackson up, dumped him across the counter, and served drinks to everybody. Jackson sent for the police, and they came and took John away. He dreaded coming into Calgary as much as we dreaded unfamiliar neighborhoods and hockey rinks. He liked the country, his cows, his dogs, his horses. There's something about horses, especially pain. Whenever I see horses, I see a sadness in their face. See, I was raised with the West around Enough to hum the tune But I never knew the place like the old boys did She looked and mountain viewed This was all a cathedral And the cowboys, they all knew That you can't keep your loop on paradise And she disappeared so soon Something about horses, especially pain. Whenever I see horses, I see a path I didn't take.
We arrived at four in the afternoon at Joe Trollinger's. The yard was full of rigs and there was over a hundred head in the stable and another hundred in the corral and still more coming. They seemed to be coming all night from Calgary, from the Leavings, McLeod and the ranches south of the creek. From the head of High River, right to the mouth. John Ware would be there and some said that they didn't even care about the dances anyways. They just wanted to hear John call the dances. Straight after supper, we commenced to dancing all the way up until midnight. John Ware, Braden, and Tom Lynch could have danced till doomsday. John called the dances and did it way up. It was the way up dance of the century. As I began research on the ranching frontier, I read literally everything I could get my hands on. But what I wanted especially was original of sources. Course. Yeah. So I began, for example, reading uh, the newspapers, the Fort McLeod Gazette, the Fincher Creek Echo. And uh, in the Fort McLeod Gazette, very early on, I found reference to John Ware commenting on his presence in the community and commenting on uh, how well regarded he was. That was a rare entry. Not too often did they talk about the working hands on those ranches, the cowboys, unless in a very general sense. But this was very specific about John Ware very early on with reference to someone who already had stature in the ranching community. Legends around his charismatic personality and skills as a horseman also reached into the First Nations of Treaty 7 territory. Well, it's an interesting relationship between the Indigenous and the Black people throughout history. Yeah. So oh, yeah. There's, I'm sure, a lot of alliances created oh, there. Oh, yeah. Even mm -hmm. um, among my ancestors who came in 1910, there were so many. But I have many doubts around the way that relationship has been reported. In particular, the legend that he was known by the Blackfoot as Bad Black White Man. I'm sure he must have been in this part. Oh, I'm sure he did, if he had point. to come up from... Because, you know, we're really close to the Montana border, right? Yeah, because those would have been the first people he met. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I've asked four Blackfoot speakers about it, and each has found it a puzzle. I think I was 12. I think 11. I was 12, 11 yeah. or 12 when we met. Yeah. Because one of the things I've been learning through you is that there are some things that can be expressed in Blackfoot that really can't be expressed in English. There's no, no... there's no English translation. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about the name that John Ware was supposed to have been given by the Blackfoot people because the story goes that he was introduced to Crowfoot, that Crowfoot liked him, and they became and remained friends. Uh, and whenever I saw his name, I've, I've written it down here so we can look at it. Is that uh, Matoxi? Yeah. yeah, but I've seen it written so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So those are three of the ways I've seen it written. Okay, let's take a look. But my doxy, there's, I just, I've asked, and there's just no, no one can figure out. So whenever I have read that that's the name that the Blackfoot called John Ware, then it also goes on to try to translate, and it mm -hmm. says it meant bad black white man. No. No? No. No, it would just be black white man. There were lots of black men around. Oh, yeah. And I have heard that they were all called black white man. Yeah, and you, big one. Yeah, and you helped me to understand mm -hmm. that Again, there was no word for a, a black person. But we viewed you also as a white person. Right. Because if you're, you all spoke English. Right. We didn't. So that's where the combination is Siksapi Kowan, black, white man. Maybe they gave him a Blackfoot name, but whoever wrote it down 
could have mistranslated yes, it. Yes. Well, or that's it. that's a big part of the issue is mm-hmm. that both your history and my history were written down by people that were not from inside our communities. Mm-hmm. And therefore, there's a lot of things that are lost in translation mm-hmm. for that reason. Maybe he was known as the Madaki man. That's a potato man. It's <laughs> as close as I can get to Madaxi. And so maybe they, he provided potatoes to the community. I have other doubts about the way his story has been told. The most pressing of all those doubts is the question of where he was born and grew up. I believe we will never be able to truly understand his story until that question is resolved. It was through my searches of Nettie's papers that I began to question the narrative Grant McEwen put forward in the first three chapters of John Ware's Cow Country. He claimed John Ware was born on a plantation near Georgetown, South Carolina. I combed through and then followed up on years of research that Nettie herself conducted, along with Don Mallory Sr., trying to find evidence to support it. I don't know anything about the American side of his life. Grandmother Lewis and father used to stay up all hours of the night drinking coffee and talking. If I'd known we were going to be famous, I would have paid more attention. Did you try to, did you go down some roads and try to confirm the, the story as Grant McEwen told it in John Ware's Cow Country? Because it's very specific and it, it highly is. detailed. I, in the sources I looked at, which was everything I could get my hands on relating to the ranching frontier in Southern Alberta, I could find no evidence of that. I find that I feel a little bit torn whenever I talk about Grant McEwen and Mm -hmm. that book specifically, because Mm -hmm. he probably should have been more upfront about where he had to speculate. Or maybe he just assumed that people would know it was speculation. And perhaps it's not even his fault that people have taken that story at face value. I knew Grant McEwen quite well. I found him to be a very generous Mm -hmm. uh, individual who was always very kind and and helpful to to me. What I also found too, though, he uh, it his feelings weren't hurt if you disagreed. Uh, He had a a wide and substantial uh, knowledge, but he was quite prepared to admit that maybe this part of the story needed uh, oh a bit of massaging or Mm -hmm. perhaps even. needed to be uh, rewritten. I think he wanted to tell the story, the stories of the early frontier period. And he had a very folksy way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And I would add about writing biography, you know, the line between history and historical fiction is a fine one. And I think as historians, we have to be very careful about that. There is a fine line, and I'm aware that I walk it. Although committed to sharing what truth I can find, I know I'm not objective. I love the Ware children. I love Mildred. I love John Ware. When I miss him the most, this is where I come. Hello. Hello. You're Lance. I'm Lance. How are you? I'm good. I'm Cheryl. How good are you? Good to meet you, Cheryl. Doing great. Good, good. Any trouble finding the place? No, not really. Good. Got a bit slowed down, but good. by construction. And through the generosity of another Southern Alberta family, the Fishers, whose connections to John Ware go back to the 1880s, this is where I continue searching for clues. Okay, Come on great. Up. Yeah. Let's go have a seat and look at some pictures. I've got an area shot of 1926 of John Ware's homestead. And as you can see here, 
We also know John Ware dug an irrigation ditch along that hillside below there, and you can see it here. So I believe we're in the right area. You can also see here, this is remnants of that irrigation ditch, even in 2017. Well, sure. A little bit of a different shade there. We usually don't have this wealth of information, which th this is really great having these historical photos, not just at the time that it was occupied, but at subsequent points between now and then. What is it that, that you're trying to find? What, what is it that you're hoping to find uh, at, the, at the site? In my wildest dreams, I would find, you would find, a metal box full of letters that gave me some clues about uh, where, where John Ware came from originally. And does it say, to Cheryl, love John? <laughs> <laughs> to this person in the future. Ah. Yeah, that would be great. Time uh, yeah, yes. but uh, I mean, uh, obviously that's not going to happen. But for me personally, um, anything at all, no matter how, you know, if it was a button or, or a button hook or anything that had belonged to the wares would be significant to me personally. In terms of the research that I'm trying to do here, anything that could provide even the remotest clue about where he came from. So an artifact that maybe was only manufactured in one particular place in a particular year any anything like that would be awesome. So uh, I think I'm really excited about getting over there and taking a look around, right, Steve? Let's go get John Ware's love letters. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so all these structures were visible in 1926. In 1926. Okay. So I identified uh, five, really four structures. This I believe this to be the barn. This just due south from the cabin. What we're, we're assuming is the cabin at number one. Anyway, so I was just going to suggest we, we head up to these coordinates here and plant a little flag in and at the location that we're going to consider the center of the cabin, and we'll set up our grids around that center point. Do I have to get a permit? Basically oriented along this line. So we'll just we'll start to set one there and then go up 30, and then we'll just build <laughs> this first grid here. Bo, lift up. And we're almost there. Got it. That's set up to collect uh, data on a time basis, mm -hmm. so you have to keep your pace perfectly steady. Would you like to give a traverse? I would. A try? Okay. I would. <laughs> okay, so I hit the button when I cross the line. Yep. Okay. A little bit more brisk than that. Okay. Go ahead. The professional surveyors kindly allow me to play detective. With this survey, we're trying to map small changes underground caused by concentrations of buried iron-based minerals. This will help the archaeologists figure out where to dig. John and Mildred Ware had many friends in Millerville. John Quirk was one of their closest. Mr. Quirk and father were in Calgary. Mr. Quirk liked to drink a fair amount. And father would take a drink too, you know? Mr. Quirk had $300 on him. So father told him, you go home. But he didn't go home. So father took his $300. After he came to, he went to father bemoaning about the fact that he hadn't gone home when he told him to, and now he'd lost his $300. Well, father let him stew a little while then gave him back his money and told him to go home again. But again, he didn't go home. And this time, he did lose his $300. Mrs. Quirk was always mad at father about that. Up in my room, Up in my room. There's music in the air Up in my room, Up in my room. Everywhere I go, the music in the air. Oh, I really do believe the 
must be heaven somewhere All over the world All over the world There's music in the air All over the world All over the world So we've got our results from Lance you, yeah. the other day. Based on the data gathered by Lance and his crew of surveyors, the archaeologist brings her crew to start the dig. You can see how much over 100 years, how much uh, vegetation gets covered. Yes. It's just natural. Black piece here. We're about to, for now. Did you guys find anything? We did, yeah. We found a horseshoe. A horseshoe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How deep are you going now? Uh, it's probably like 35 right now. So it's deeper feet. than I thought it was. Look at that. Look wow. at that. Wow. So that is down about, you say, 35 yeah. centimeters? Yeah, I think so. And we found a piece of bone. So that's cow probably, cow or bison. So in this case, it's at the same level as that horseshoe, so it's not gonna be bison, right? This actually looks like a handmade nail. Nails were handmade like by farriers or farmers, same as horseshoes. Pounded to a point? Yeah, and then uh, in and the late, eh, I can't remember exactly when, but they started doing wire drawn nails and that's when you get the circular nails like we get now, right? Mm, Essentially, yeah. yeah. Was uh, John where uh, a, a Blacksmith, he probably trimmed his own horses and maybe put He did do blacksmithing. Nettie's favorite joke was about ending up with a long tongue because she got it stuck to a frozen anvil as a kid. The house is on an angle that oh, way. Oh, that could be for sure. I remember the first pair of spurs I ever had. Found them on the Christmas tree in the cabin. Every Saturday night, we gathered for songs and for a good scrubbing in a big tub in the kitchen. Every Sunday in summer, we climb in the Democrat and go for a picnic in the hills. Except if we were in Calgary, we were all marched off to church. Whenever I'm on this land, I feel very much in communion with John Ware's spirit and the spirit of his wife and his kids, who would have the kids would have run around on this piece of ground where we're standing right now many, many times, and Mildred would have looked out the window yeah. and, you know, watched them going about their, their business of play or, or helping their dad. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's always a very powerful experience yeah, for, sure. for me to be here, and I, I always feel their presence That's when nice. I'm here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. No box of letters. Nothing that provides information about his origins. Still, a pretty decent haul for just one day. A couple of everyday objects he might have made. His hand, perhaps the last to touch them, before I reach into the earth to touch them with my own. A good day's work, and worth it to me, to the fishers, and to the archaeologists. They file a report to the Historical Resources Branch of Alberta Culture, recognizing the significance of the site and recommending further archaeological exploration. All the threads I've been pulling need another set of eyes, and I start working with a professional researcher, Don Slater. Thousands of African-American wares show up in our research. It seems like about half of the males were named John. We follow up on all of them. In 
In and amongst my searches, a clue turns up that provides new information. Of all the documents available to us that speculate about his origins, this is the only one we can say with any certainty is based on information that John Ware himself provided. When they registered their marriage, he said he was born in Tennessee. My starting point with research with John Ware was the 1870 and 1880 U.S. censuses because information that we have suggests that he probably was enslaved, so he would not have appeared on a census in 1860. And then he entered Canada in 1882. That's very well documented. Your background information told me that uh, John Ware had several siblings. He was supposed to have had siblings Amanda and Robert. And then there was a newspaper article you mentioned that said that there was a George Ware who came through Alberta in 1910, which would have been after John Ware's death, but he was looking for work and claiming he was John's brother. During my research, I found a cluster of African Americans with the surname Ware who were living in Haywood County, Tennessee, and this is the 1870 census. Living side by side with the cluster of Wares in Tennessee, Don also finds several African-American families surnamed Nelson. A couple of Johns show up in the Nelson cluster. Uh, John Ware Cowboy said on his marriage record that he was born in Tennessee and his parents' names were Nelson and Ann Ware. When I got that information from you, I thought this is going to be wonderful. I shouldn't have any trouble finding a man named Nelson Ware in the 1870 or 1880 census, provided he was still living. It was not as easy as I thought. But Nelson is not a common first name. We definitely need to keep this cluster of people in mind as potential relatives of Cowboy John Ware. One of his sons' name is Arthur Nelson mm. Ware. So I agree with you that the fact that the name Nelson is there is, is pretty promising. And we also need to keep in mind when doing African-American research that people with the same surname weren't necessarily blood-related, and people with different surnames may have been. When people were freed in 1865 at the end of the Civil War, they had no surnames, just most of them didn't, and so they chose a surname. And it's commonly believed that people chose the name of their most recent slaveholder, but this is not necessarily the case. In fact, studies have shown that it's probably fewer than half of freedmen took their most recent slaveholder's surname. So they may have taken the name of a former slaveholder who was perhaps more kind to them than their most recent slaveholder. That's exactly what happened in my family. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother's surname was Glover, but that was not the, the surname that they were using at the time of emancipation. They went back to the name of Glover because it was a person who they had liked better than their most recent slaveholder. And some newly freed people took names that had nothing to do with former slaveholders. So relationships are hard to determine. That's another challenge of doing African-American research. That conversation is like a stick of dynamite. What if he or his family changed their name? What if he chose to be John Ware instead of someone else he used to be? Having to reckon with that possibility is at first devastating. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes intriguing, even thrilling. Millerville is the place where they are always alive for me. I was always out with my father and was never any help to my mother at all. She always said that riding a horse was the ruin of a girl. Mr. Harold Smith told me he could remember me with my little pony, holding the cattle to the flats while we were moving to Brooks. Duchess is the place where they died. John Ware's desire to expand his Millerville ranch put him in conflict with the government's new aspirations for homesteader settlement in the Millerville area. For complicated reasons, he moved his family to the Duchess area, north of Brooks, in 1902. The Ware children never adjusted to the move. 
they were a long way from the nearest neighbors. Their new baby brother Daniel failed to thrive. Their mother felt cut off from the world. This is a place and a piece of their lives I avoided for years. It's where Mildred's health started to falter. Their first cabin in Duchess flooded out in 1902, and they had to rebuild in a hurry from logs he dragged out of the Red Deer River. The new cabin was nothing like the gem he had built for her in Millerville. I've always believed it was temporary, a hasty stopgap. One day, Mildred fell deadly ill. John traveled by horse, then on foot when his frightened horse refused to go any further, then by train. From Duchess to Brooks, from Brooks to Calgary, and then back again to get her medicine. The time I've lived since then don't seem real when I count it back. Just an endless tunnel, long and hard, hard and black. I calculated it would have taken him about 18 hours. She survived. That time. Then two-year-old baby Daniel died. Mildred never recovered from that loss. But I fear time howling after notching bones and breaking skin. She's just beyond my reach, though I see her smiling from within. I know she can't be alone when darkness come crashing in. The hours since I left don't seem real when I count them down. Just an endless tunnel, long and hot and spiraling round. At the end, there is a silence that will hear no prayer. We all give our 18 hours in despair. On my knees, I learned to stand these many years ago. But only God can raise a tall man just to bring him low. On my knees I see the end howling in ice and snow. On my knees I see the end that lies in wait below. God give me 18 hours to save my soul. In March of 1905, father took mother to the Holy Cross Hospital in Calgary. She died there 10 days later of pneumonia, leaving us five children. We were diving cattle from Maine's that day. He'd ridden up to my cousin Charlie's that morning and helped us move the cattle to his place because he had the only dipping vat in the area. I had to ride back to Charlie's to do chores, so after supper, John came out to the barn with me and settled up a heavy horse he used for the winter. We left the barn together, him to ride north back to Honey Hill so he could turn his cattle back and gather them more easily in the morning to dip. I went west. On my return, early the next morning, they told me he was dead. My cousin had already left with his body for Brooks and then by train to Calgary. The children were taken in by Mildred's parents, Daniel and Charlotte, in this home in Calgary that Daniel built to house his own large family and his five orphaned grandchildren. Their grandmother adored them. They loved falling asleep to the sound of their grandfather playing the harp that he built with his own hands. As I'm sitting here right now, I can smell the sage and 
I can see the moon rising up in the sky and I can envision all the good times he had right in this very spot with his friend Charlie Douglas. That is something that brings me a lot of comfort to think about. And then just to be here on the spot where, yes, it was the, it was the site of his, his last night, but it was also, I'm sure, the place of much happiness and laughter and shared good times. The search is ongoing. It may take years to explore the cluster of Nelsons and Wares. It may take years to get the DNA results and follow those threads. I'm hopeful those threads will lead to relatives descended from the siblings he left behind. So what am I left with? Still a mystery. Maybe even a deeper mystery if I'm searching for someone who changed his name. But I have key information I didn't have before I started on this journey. He said Tennessee. That's where I'm focused. I'll keep looking. I'll keep reclaiming. And everything I find, I'll let you know. It's kind of nice to think of them here together. Mm -hmm. Whenever I come, I try to clear away some of the grass and right. overgrowth, but it seems to grow back very quickly. Mm -hmm. We just did Mildred's a couple of weeks ago. It's to keep you coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Yeah. The funeral of the late John Ware was held this afternoon. Reverend F. W. Patterson conducted the services. In his remarks, Reverend Patterson said, John Ware was a man with a beautiful skin. To know John Ware was to know a gentle man, one of God's gentlemen. A great many from remote districts, as well as townspeople, came to pay their respects to one of Alberta's pioneers. He was taken from the Baptist Church to the Union Cemetery. Do you notice how life gets harder when you have more to live for Days of worry Nights of prayer Fathoms deep In might and soil I see in the lines Upon your face, dear that sweet girl I built a life for Now a woman Worn with patience Baptized in the flood and toil But the sky above Big enough to wrap us both up safe and sound And next year's green is singing to you If you pray, go you right to the ground The stars will shiver when I whisper Sweet things to you And there's always a better year away Beyond the blue K 
cows are dying The fields are barren And the girls both Have a fever Oh my darling Do you remember Just what it is We're waiting for I know this life Lies heavy on you But that's what keeps us From drifting seaward Our love will live here Beneath the river It's been written by The wind and snow And the sky above Is big enough to wrap us both up Safe and sound And next year's green Is singing to you And stars will shiver when I whisper sweet things to you. And there's always a better 